church. Good morning. My new, a new uh, routine. I've got to get up here and get this done while the psalm is still going because my youngest son, Caleb, who preaches in Michigan, he has noticed I make funny noises when I'm setting things up uh, before I start preaching. And so I thought, i got to get up there while they're still singing. So if I make noises, he can't hear them. Uh, I hope that is the case. It is so good. What a blessing to be together. Uh, for those visiting, we're so glad to have you with us this morning. For those online, always good to have you with us as well. I got a smile this morning uh, from Zane Kreitz, who is nine years old. Uh, why did the football coach shake the soda vending machine? Because he wanted his quarterback. <laughs> All right, Zane. Zane, you live to give another joke another time. That's all right. Uh, last weekend, I was invited to, to speak and be one of the speakers for a big event down at the Eastside Church in Colorado Springs. Uh, it's the, the summit, and the theme was called Uncommon. And the, the, the challenge was to, to help us as men, it's a men's summit, to, to understand what it means to be uncommon, to be out of the ordinary, to be different than the world, different in how we live our lives, different in how we are husbands, different in how we're fathers, different in how we are leaders. And this year, the main text was from Romans 12 on transformation, change, and, and the process. And I spoke at that event, and I worked through this past week, and then the thought still lingering in my mind said, I should probably go a little deeper into that and maybe preach about it at Tri Lakes. And so I had my chair prayer walk on Tuesday, and lo and behold, here I am wanting to go into it a little deeper. And in the meantime, at our Friday gathering at coffee in the group was uh, Rod Nordman had told me that, uh, given me an update on Alex, their son, and said, well, he's getting ready to take his driver's permit test. And I said, no way. <laughs> Since when is Colorado giving driver's permits to little kids? And he said, great, he's, he's a freshman in high school. And I said, no way. When did that happen? And, and it just threw me so much because in my mind, when I hear the name Alex Nordman, I have this image in my mind. And I got back to my office. It shook me so much. I got into my phone, into the photo library, just to confirm what I knew was true. And I have this image of Alex. I love going and watching him play soccer and different things. And so when Rod said driver's permit, I said, no way. That doesn't, that doesn't match with what I, what I know about Alex. And then I got back, and I was getting ready to, to give Rod an email and a text. And I said, see, you were so wrong. Uh, there's no way Alex can be getting his driver's permit. And then I noticed the time stamp with the date on the photo in my little library. It was from 2016, eight years ago. And yet that was the image that I had in my mind. And I said, when did that change happen? And maybe I'm not the only one. And if so, I'd just like to let you know, Alex, when you see him, he's changed. <laughs> he has changed, come to find out. When did that happen? It shook me up so much that I thought even more about this whole transformation, this whole change process. I looked around at other uh, of our youth and thought, when did this happen? They're all growing up. They're changing right before our eyes. It's so fast. And I realized there's more I need to talk about. So let's get started on another adventure through God's word this morning. Please get your Bibles out and turn them to Romans chapter 12. While you're there, let's establish the context, 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 leading into Romans chapter 12. From Romans 1 to Romans 11, Paul is going to be teaching and admonishing and encouraging the church in Rome. They've gone through a lot, mostly Jewish, but then came the change and some of the Gentiles. And God's plan revealed that, in fact, they're going to be included in God's family. And it's not going over so well. 
And so Paul's going to go into a little history and saying, here's what it was. God said, I'll show mercy to whom I choose to show mercy to. Israel once again had rejected God and went their rebellious ways and turned away from God. And instead of sending the Babylonians or some awful nation to go and capture his people and punish them for 70 years, he did something different. He said, I'll tell you what, Gentiles, come to me. Come on in. I'm going to give you a branch on the tree with the rest of my people. But then comes the warning. In Romans 11, Paul will say, but listen, Gentiles, don't you dare be filled with arrogance and pride. Don't you dare look down on the other branches thinking you're better than them because I'll break your branch off just as quickly as I would of anybody else. There's your context going into Romans chapter 12. So then he tells all of God's people how to do this, how to accomplish God's plan and what God is wanting for them to experience. He says, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. How do we do this? Well, Paul's going to tell them in verse 2. Do not be conformed any longer to the pattern of this world. Be transformed. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good and pleasing and perfect will. Our focus this morning is going to be on that word, transformed. Be transformed from the Greek the Greek word metamorphosed, I don't pronounce it officially. Some say, well, if you know Greek, you got it. I got my favorite Greek word, which is baloney. That's right. <laughs> but I do know our word, metamorphosis. Better start here, the definition by human interpretation. Go to people like Webster. Uh, they tell us that, that metamorphosis is a change of, uh, of physical form, of structure or substance, especially by supernatural means. I love that. That's kind of exciting. Well, what is supernatural? Well, the same dictionary tells us supernatural is of or relating to an order of existence beyond the visible, observable universe. You can't see it. Especially of or relating to God or God. Well, what is it? Well, transform. Metamorphosis is about being completely changed from one form to another. Completely changed. Completely different. The best example, I know everybody's going to go to that one that gets used all the time, but for me, I like human examples. And when it comes to human examples, I like using myself. And I think I have the most powerful example, if you want, about transformation, about metamorphosis, about changing completely. You could take one look at me before coffee <laughs> and one look at me after coffee. And that's all you need to remember about metamorphosis. It's a complete, it's a miracle. Stephen Reutsch did a class Wednesday night on miracles. Do they happen? Yes, they do. I'm living proof. And miracles happen. Metamorphosis completely transformed, completely changed. And, and the most popular example of all seems, though, to be in the animal, in the insect world. We use the caterpillar to the butterfly. Metamorphosis completely changed. To which I say, fair enough. But do you really understand, really understand the power of that example? And all that it stands for concerning the process of metamorphosis, of change, the transformation of a caterpillar to a butterfly. The Apostle Paul teaches that we are to not be conformed to this world. Stop it! But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Be changed. And the word he uses is the Greek metamorphosis. Like a caterpillar to a butterfly. I've come this morning with some encouragement and a challenge to, to help us grow in our understanding of this process. And specifically of how we're going to use it to apply 
in cheering on Caterpillar Christians. And if it seems I'm even a little more excited than usual with the title, let me explain it on the top of my battalion. Tim Slater is back visiting us. I got your name right. It's on progress. Tim Slater's back from the Dominican Republic. Such a great work uh, that Tri Lakes is connected with. And so, welcome. Uh, but I was sharing with him in my office this morning on my bookcase in my office. I have a diploma from the University of Northern Colorado in Greeley. And the date is 1985. It was, yeah. <laughs> Did everybody that was here last week wonder whose cell phone went off in the middle of my sermon? Anyway, we, we've got this, I got this diploma up there, which is proof that I had completed my education at the university and I had my certification to become a biology teacher in school. Uh, my life journey took a separate path where I never did become a teacher of biology in a school, but I've used that education through different events and settings like preaching. So I'm a little excited today to kind of bring it back so it justifies the money that was spent <laughs> to get me that, that diploma. Let's consider the physical process of the transformation of a caterpillar to a butterfly. It starts with a butterfly laying eggs. Eggs on leaves or branches, sometimes in the ground where they're safe. And then that egg will develop and the larva will come out and it will be a caterpillar. Now, I don't know if you've done any study or research on caterpillars. It'll blow your mind. Seriously. It's amazing. So many facts. Some of the facts. They don't have lungs. Uh, and so many different facts. I just picked a couple of my favorites. Uh, muscles. Muscles. Humans have 629-ish muscles, Six, 629. Caterpillars have 4,000 muscles, 4,000. Uh, and the other thing that, that gets me is when a caterpillar comes to being, they have one mission, one goal, one purpose, and that is to eat everything that's in front of them, leaves and branches, dirt. Everything is, they, they eat, they eat, they eat. So much so, the fact is that a caterpillar can eat as much as 27,000 times their body size. 27,000. Now, I love how we can relate humans to caterpillars. I can do that at Thanksgiving. <laughs> at Thanksgiving, I can do 27,000 times in my body size, I'm just saying. But then comes the goosebumpy the goosebumpy part of what happens to that caterpillar. Within that caterpillar, I call it a heavenly instinct from the divine nature of the one that created it. From within that caterpillar, there seems to be this desire to fly. They can't fly because they don't have wings, but within them is a desire to fly. And within them is the instinct to know what they must do in order to accomplish that. And the thing of all the eating is that they're getting all the nourishment they can to store in their bodies for this incredible process that's about to take place. And what it is, instinct will tell them it's time and they will crawl up to some place where they know there's good protection. They'll be upside down. And then a layer of skin goes under their outer layer and begins to harden and it becomes a chrysalis. It's not a cocoon. Here's a little side note for you. You say, well, it's a butterfly cocoon. Butterflies don't have cocoons. Cocoons are made with silk and this stuff. Those are what are made by the caterpillars that end up with moths. But butterflies, they are chrysalis. It's a chrysalis. It becomes hard and it seals that caterpillar in. And it's then that all that nourishment takes place, but it's then that they will release digestive enzymes from within their caterpillar body. And those digestive enzymes are like acid from the inside out. And it begins to dissolve the caterpillar's body. The caterpillar dies. And from that, all you have, if you would, and don't do it, but if you had one and you cut that open in the middle, you would have a, a puddle of liquid goo. That's all that's left of that caterpillar. But if you leave it in there, what's within that caterpillar are these things called imaginal disk. 
And imagine the disc are just cells, small, small, small. But when they get all that nourishment that that caterpillar has been consuming their little lives, and that, that nourishment will help those cells to start growing and duplicating and everything else. And each imaginal disc has like a blueprint to a specific part of a butterfly. One disc may have the, the blueprint that would develop into a, a leg. Another disc might have the blueprint that develop into an eye, another one an antenna, another one a wing. And they grow into these body parts of a butterfly, and then those body parts come together. And out from that chrysalis emerges a beautiful butterfly. It's not a caterpillar anymore. The caterpillar's long gone. And I, I tell you that the most amazing part, I'm reminded of what the psalmist had to say, talking about humans and how God, the creator, is involved with creating humans. And God creates our inmost being. God knits us together in our mother's womb. And we praise God because we're fearfully and wonderfully made. That's humans. Have you ever thought about the insect world? And that's why Paul is going to use the example to say, by the way, take a look around you. If you're wondering if there's a God, a creator, take a look around you. All creation testifies. We are without excuse to know that God is real. But think about it. It's this word. It's this word, this transformation, this metamorphosis. It's a complete change. It goes from caterpillars when they come out and they're just eating everything, they're officially pests. Farmers and the like are going to do everything they can to get rid of caterpillars because they'll destroy the whole crop. They're just eating everything, devouring everything for themselves all around them. But then comes the, the chrysalis time and, and then the, the, the liquefaction of that, bud, that caterpillar and, and, and butterflies come out. And the butterfly is completely opposite. They want nothing to do with their old life, their old caterpillar life, eating leaves and branches and dirt. Butterflies live on sweet nectar of flowers. Transformation. Metamorphosis. And this is the word that, that Paul is going to use to encourage the saints in Rome to say, here's what God wants you to experience. No more part of this world. You're different. Completely different. He says, I want you to, to change. And to those who, who finally reached out, and as we're told in Acts 17, they reached out and they found God, realizing he was never far from them. The problem was they'd just been like caterpillars, just consuming everything around them for themselves. All about the ways of the world. But when they finally realized that God was real, and they finally understood that God loves them. So much so that he's inviting them into a, a very specific personal relationship with him. And Paul's going to say, amen and amen. Now you're on the right path. You understand. Great. You've responded. Great. Now grow. Grow. From a caterpillar to a butterfly. Renew your mind. Stop thinking of things about the world and operating like the world. Set your thoughts on things above, not on the things of the world of darkness. Be transformed. Be changed. Put away your caterpillar thoughts and ways, and you can fly. Paul also, throughout all of his letters, if you take note, he'll bring out the point as to how this happens and what, most importantly, that people need to understand. In Ephesians chapter 4, if you're in your Bibles, follow along. We won't read all of them, but we'll definitely point out very quickly how Paul is teaching all of them to be butterflies and the process, how you become a butterfly. He, he says in, in chapter 4, in verse 20, when you came to know Christ, he says, you heard of him, you were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires to be made new, 
Be made new in the attitude of your minds. Put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, here it comes, each of you must put off. Just like the chrysalis event. You must put off falsehood. Speak truthful to your neighbor, for we're all members of one body. In your anger, don't sin. Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry. And don't give the devil a foothold. If you've been stealing, would you stop? And you need to do something useful with your hands. Since you can have something to share with those in need. That's called work. Don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths. Only what's helpful, encouraging to build others up according to their needs. Not yours. You're not a caterpillar anymore. That it can benefit those who listen. And don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. And get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling, slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind. Be compassionate to one another. Forgive each other just in Christ. God forgave you. Be imitators of God. And he goes on to, to let them know this is about the change. This is about the transformation. This is about becoming something completely different than what you were when your mind was only set on the world and what the world was about. Might as well get us all the way coming to the finish line with our so what. How does it apply to you and me? I only have one approach in how I preach. If you've known me very long at all, you know it's from a very simple perspective with questions. So let's start with considering this. Do you remember? Uh, let's talk about it. And, and you know, Paul never says caterpillar and butterfly. He just uses the word metamorphosis, and we use that example. But what a perfect example it is. So imagine us in that process, wherever you are today. For those here, for those online, wherever you are in your caterpillar life. Maybe you did learn about God and his incredible plan for you. And maybe you did happen to reach out because you understood just enough to know he's real. And he sent his son Jesus to die for you. And God raised him from the dead. And perhaps you responded and you repented of your sins. You turned around from the caterpillar ways and reached out and said, I want God to be the one that determines my steps. And maybe you were immersed in the waters of baptism to begin that transformation process from a caterpillar to a butterfly. The, the first question I want to know, do you remember who you were? Do you remember your caterpillar days? Now, I was thinking of even uh, looking through yearbooks. Does it show the yearbooks of your caterpillar days? And I was wondering what that would look like. And for some reason, Bruce Edinger popped into my mind. And, and now I got this image, and I just cannot get the image out of my mind <laughs> of caterpillar days. I just can't do it. Help me. So then i got to replace it. And Do you remember your caterpillar days? I remember mine. I'm still in a lot of them. It's hard to forget, just like caterpillars going around, devouring, consuming everything I could for myself from this world. I called the shots. I made the rules. I treat people the way I wanted to treat people. You hurt me, I'll destroy you. You disappoint me, I'll write you off. I live my life according to my rules, no one else's. And then I learned about God from an amazing church in Holly, Colorado, where I was born and raised, along with my wife. I repented. I was baptized. So the question I come with this morning that I struggle with concerning this whole transformation, did I become a butterfly then? When do I become a butterfly? Some might say, well, that doesn't happen until... The end comes and you stand before God. That's when we're complete. And I said, then why did Paul say, I want you to, to tra be transformed by the renewing of your mind? Then you can test what God's will is. Well, what good is that if I don't get to use any of that until I'm in heaven? So when did I become a butterfly or have I? When do we know if we've been transformed? Another question, and this comes with what I refer to as caterpillar thoughts. 
So maybe as I've listened to some folks that try to help me to understand this process, maybe the most important that's on my mind is I wonder if I'm still in the process of transformation and I haven't quite achieved the butterfly stage yet and then I die, can caterpillars get into heaven? That's what I want to know. Before being transformed into a butterfly, can a caterpillar get into heaven? If so, then I confessed at the start of this adventure. I need to know because I've confessed what makes me the right mind is, will there be coffee for me <laughs> as a caterpillar? Because if I haven't been transformed, if I haven't been changed, I'm still having my caterpillar thoughts. <laughs> I'm going to need that. In fact, from what people have told me, oh, heaven's going to be so much more. Okay, good. Then I'm thinking then there will be Shipley Donuts <laughs> for my caterpillar mind. Now I'm feeling a little more at peace with the idea that I can be okay as a caterpillar in heaven. But then what happens if it's not true? Maybe I'll get my coffee, but they'll shut me out of heaven. Then what? I'm a butterfly. If I'm a butterfly, why do I still struggle with caterpillar thoughts? And oh, if you only knew the rest of the story, the one that I started with, the summit event, it's kind of started this whole thing. Uh, I was on my way down. I was preparing this whole message I had for their event from transformation, change. Uh, the day or so before, I had to go down to South Colorado Springs. I took our vehicle down to get an oil change at the dealership. I should never do that before I'm speaking on transformation. And on the way down, on Interstate 25, I'm driving, and there's traffic, pretty good traffic, and there's a truck in the slow lane, and I'm in the lane next to it, and we're just kind of driving along, and there's space between us. And I see in my rearview mirror, mirror, there are two vehicles coming up from the back, and they are coming through lane, all from one side of the interstate to the other, dodging in and out of traffic. And I'm going, what? Maybe it's a police chase, something like that. And it's, and it's a Camaro and a souped-up Corvette. And this Camaro comes screaming around, and, and I'm just trying to keep in line, and the truck is in ahead of me a little bit, and there's a little space between us. The Camaro comes around and cuts in front of me to get into the lane to keep moving. Well, the Corvette, you know, I think they were playing tag on the interstate. The Corvette is coming up, screaming up, and I'm looking going, oh, this isn't going to end well. And he comes screaming up. And meanwhile, the truck is slowing down, and I have cars behind me. I can't stop, so I'm just going. Well, the space between me and my lane and the truck in his lane is only like a half a car lane. Corvette comes screaming up and slams on his brake and honks his horn and gives me a little wave. That's not a good wave. Now, my butterfly wife was not there because she would always say, well, God bless you, too. I used those words, but it wasn't in that tone. <laughs> From there, it gets worse. I kept driving and got down to the dealership, uh, and I'm pulling in, and there's a light, and it's turning, but there was someone walking, so I'm waiting for that, but the person behind me wants me to go, so, <laughs> and I went, what is going on today? So I wait, and I make my way around, get all the way back, I'm on my way home, same interstate, and I'm in the, in the far right lane, and there's other cars zipping, 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 and someone comes out behind, and I guess the slow lane isn't the slow lane for everybody, because they're saying, you're not going fast enough. Ha! Three times I was honked at on that trip. Three. I have never been honked at three times in my life in one trip. Three times. And then I get back, and I think, and I'm going to speak on transformation. Because my caterpillar thoughts were out of control <laughs> on that interstate. And I thought, you know me and the importance of the significance and symbolism of numbers. I said three. Yeah. Yeah, that's a funny one, Lord. God's number. And so it brings me to my confessions from a caterpillar. It just pours out sometimes. Many times. I thought in the, in the midst of all of that, I thought the, the one, especially the second honk, I was going to turn around and get out of my car. 
and I was going to go back, and I was, I was going to use my Starbucks story. I was going to say, let me tell you something. At the Starbucks store down from my house, I'm the kindest, nicest customer they have. They give me free. How are you honking at me, brother? You need to get right. I, I battled that thought, but it didn't go away. So I've got confessions many times, and not just on those things, but many times... I guess I'm a caterpillar because I still struggle with my caterpillar thoughts. And many times I get so discouraged and so frustrated and so intimidated, especially in church, by so many folks that evidently are butterflies because they have no hesitancy in claiming that that's what they are. And they're certainly not very nice butterflies. I read the passage from Romans 12 about not conforming to the patterns of this world and to be transformed by the renewing of my mind. And it makes sense, but it's certainly not easy. And I wonder why the very next thing the Apostle Paul says, after telling us to be transformed, have you noticed the very next verse, Romans 12, verse 3? After telling us the process and the plan of God, be transformed. Don't conform to the pattern of the world any longer. Be transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind. And then he says, by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, don't you think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment. In accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you, he's repeating what he started with in Romans don't you become arrogant thinking you've arrived. I confess, I get a bit discouraged of all the butterflies flying around and proclaiming they have all the answers, saying things like what we need to do is this and what this church needs is this and what you need to do is this. And I, I look and I get so discouraged because not only do I not have all the answers, I really didn't understand any of the questions. They're way over my little caterpillar head even though it has 2,000 more muscles than all the butterfly heads. So then I got to ask, is there hope for the caterpillars? Maybe I should ask, do you know if there are any caterpillar churches in the area that can take care of the needs of a struggling caterpillar who believes in God, who has done all that God has told him to do, but still struggles in becoming that butterfly, maybe, maybe there's a caterpillar church somewhere. But I think back almost 16 years ago, coming up, Trish and I were called, we know for certainty, called by God to leave this amazing church in Burlington, Colorado, and to come here to this amazing church, the Trial Lakes Church. And we remember, I remember the first gathering, the meeting we had, and I was trying this church out. Let's get that record straight. I'm not trying out for anything. I was perfectly happy where I was, but I came to try this church out to say, is there a place? Is God wanting us to come to this place? And the elders at the time shared with me their vision, their passion for what they wanted for their flock. And they told me specifically from week to week all they wanted was this, to challenge the flock to grow, to challenge the flock to, to look deeper and to, to come to an understanding to grow, to help them draw closer to God and each other. And I said, man, you are singing my song. I'm all about caterpillar churches, meeting people where they are, regardless of their background, regardless if they were part of some other church, whatever it is, I will preach at the most simplistic level. And if that's what you want, I promise I'm your guy. People like me with all my caterpillar thoughts. And some would say, well, are, i got to ask the question. I review from time to time. Are caterpillars still, still welcome at the tri -Lakes Church? People like me that struggles with my caterpillar thoughts, but longing to become that butterfly that God promises is coming. And some might say, well, you're the preacher. What are you talking, Academy? I said, exactly. As I told the elders in the beginning, I don't have all the answers. And I say again today, I don't have all the answers. What I do know is that I need encouragement along the way. 
And I do know that I'm not the only one. And for caterpillar Christians especially, for those who aren't familiar with all the appropriate terms and the right terms for this or the right interpretations and the doctrine of this and doctrine of this, what I do know is that we all need cheering on to keep pressing straight ahead, to continue in our renewing of our minds, of changing every day so that we're closer to being able to say what Paul said. You know, when I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child, but when I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. But as it applies to the challenge for our adventure this morning, I would put it this way, when I was a caterpillar, I talked like a caterpillar. I thought like a caterpillar. I reasoned like a caterpillar. But when I became a butterfly, I put all the ways of my caterpillar life behind me. Let me fly. I just hope as a butterfly, if it all still applies, that there's still coffee to be enjoyed for that time when it happens. I've come this morning with some encouragement and a challenge. Wherever you are in the process of transformation, Wherever you are on the journey from caterpillar to butterfly, do not be discouraged. Do not be intimidated or frustrated by ever thinking you're just not qualified to be with the rest of the butterflies. Don't do it. Those who seem so much smarter about the Bible and other things, you can do what I do. Uh, from my prison ministry days and different conversations at different church events where there are people so knowledgeable about the Bible and God and some may come and say, well, preacher, we're in this discussion of the eschatological significance relating to the pulpitarian responsibilities in the homiletical area of the kingdom and wanted to say, which is it for you? And I say, <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> That's all I know. That's all I know and still today. All I know is Jesus and him crucified. Y'all just go on ahead with all the latest and greatest debates and all the programs and the ministries and all the answers to what God is commanding that the church needs. I'll just keep crawling along if it's okay. Knowing that there really is something quite powerful when you simply stop and simply think about the process of transformation from a caterpillar wrapped up in a chrysalis dissolving into a puddle of goo and dying and then bursting forth and emerging as a new creature. And we apply it in Romans chapter 6 to what Paul has to say. What shall we say then? Verse 1, shall we go on sinning so grace may increase? By no means. We died to sin. By no means. We died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Don't you know? That all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. Here's the importance of baptism. Don't struggle. Don't overcomplicate it. It's simple. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. If we've been united with him like this in his death, we will certainly also be united with him in his resurrection. For we know, we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. Because anyone who's died has been free from sin, like a caterpillar being dissolved away and then being raised back and coming forth as a butterfly, something different. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation is come. The old is gone. The new is here. There's the greatest encouragement I believe anyone can give. Cheering on, caterpillar Christians. I, I, I received my encouragement just from this, that, that same coffee event Friday. And uh, it was after sharing my thoughts that they could stand and talking about what I was looking to, to talk about and preach this morning. It was Suzanne Pruitt who said, that's going to be a very good sermon. Now, if you disagree, don't come talk to me about it. You go, go see Suzanne. And you tell her, that's encouragement. Cheering on. May we help to cheer all of us 
as brothers and sisters in the process of transformation, especially our caterpillar Christians. Have you been made new today? Have you reached out and found God? Have you responded and repented and been immersed in the waters of baptism to be raised up brand new? If not, I'd encourage you to make that decision this very day. If you have questions, don't leave this place without asking those very questions. For all caterpillars and butterflies alike, may we never forget God's plan, his incredible plan. As Paul will tell the church in Corinth that we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory, we're being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit, so we can fly. May we be the ones that fly. If you're here this morning and you have any needs whatsoever, would you let the elders know they're at the back there in this song? But be encouraged and be an encourager. Let's stand and sing.